pleasure to be here, and thank you all for coming. Um, it's really quite a challenge to talk about such a visual subject as synesthesia without the benefit of PowerPoint slides, and a lot of them. But since we're in the gallery here, I will have to paint pictures with words. Um, this whole exhibit is a tribute to the phenomenon of synesthesia, which I know is unfamiliar to most of you. But all of you know the word anesthesia, meaning no sensation. So sharing the same root, synesthesia means joint sensation, such that my voice, for example, is not only something that you hear, but you also see it or taste it or feel it as a touch. As children, synesthetes are shocked to discover that the rest of the world isn't like them. And we once thought it was a very rare phenomenon, but now we know that synesthesia affects the brain wiring of one in every couple hundred people, including some famous artists in this exhibit. First off, however, there is some confusion about the term synesthesia, because over its 300-year history, it's been applied to wildly disparate things, from the perceptual phenomenon, to uh, poetry and metaphor, to deliberately contrived uh, mixed media applications, such as Sonia Lumiere, and uh, odorama. So first, and this exhibit unfortunately doesn't, doesn't distinguish between that, and it also uses the much less used British spelling of synesthesia, A-E. So for the science, if you Google for the science, it's just synesthesia. So we have to separate artists who used synesthesia as an intellectual idea of sensory fusion. Artists like Georgia O'Keeffe and her music, Pink and Blue, and the green music, separate her from those who had the genuine perceptual phenomenon, such as Kandinsky. Now, you may wonder how I got to be the authority on such an arcane topic. And the answer is by accident. 25 years ago, my dinner host delayed our seating with the apology that there weren't enough points on the ch chicken. And Michael Watson, who is the man who tasted shapes of that book's title, felt taste as a physical touch in his hands and on his face. And he said, with an intense flavor, a feeling sweeps down my arm and I feel weight, shape, texture, and temperature as if I'm actually grasping something. And he wanted the chicken to be a prickly, pointed shape, and it had come out all round. So I asked him a few more questions and then made my diagnosis. I said, oh, you've got synesthesia. And his response was, you mean there's a name for what I do? You see, nobody in my academic circle had ever heard of synesthesia. And science had lost interest in it for many, many decades because it couldn't explain it. I only knew the word because I had read an obscure book called The Mind of an Amanist, which described a memory expert who could retain limitless amounts thanks to a five-fold synesthesia in all of his senses. Now, my neurology colleagues joked that Michael Watson had to be on drugs. And they warned me to stay away because it was too new age, too weird, and it would ruin my career. You see, they had the typical reaction of orthodoxy to something that it can't explain, which is to shove it under the carpet. But then there was a paradigm shift, and now scientists in 15 countries are writing PhD theses and scholarly books about synesthesia. But for the longest time, mainstream science just rolled its eyes, and in trying to explain away the most common type of synesthesia, which is seeing letters and numbers in color, they argued that synesthetes were just remembering childhood associations from coloring books or refrigerator magnets. And that's why A was red or D was green, for example. But synesthesia runs strongly in families, a fact that Sir Francis Galton noted over a century ago. And it's also much more common in women. So how could it be, be childhood memories unless mothers were passing down the same magnets? <laughs> now, uh, parenthetically, synesthetic associations are idiosyncratic, meaning that even two people in the same family, or even identical twins, will see different colors. So right off we have a discrepancy between the neurologic reality and the artistic ideal of sensory fusions, uh, universal correspondences among the senses that apply to everybody. Well, what Galton noted astutely over a century ago is that otherwise normal people saw color whenever they looked at letters and numbers. In other words, the visual appearance of the written graphene triggers a response of color. Now, on the other hand, the sound of language, or what are called phonemes, are more likely to trigger synesthetic tastes. So that one synesthete, for example, the word village tastes like sausage, 
as do other words with the same idge sound, like college and message. Derek tastes like earwax, and Philip like lightly buttered toast. So it turns out that phonemes triggering taste tend to be present in the word for that taste. So thus, Sydney tastes like kidney, and Cincinnati like cinnamon. So childhood food terms act as templates for other words that trigger synesthesia. And once a link is established, it stays permanent and stable for life. So A is always red. Derek always tastes like earwax. What's fascinating is that synesthesia is, is genetically inherited, meaning it's biological. But it also requires early life exposure to culturally learned artifacts, like letters, numbers, and food categories. In fact, permanent links get established between different kinds of sensation and a whole range of categories as shown by the wide variety of synesthetic types, because what the gene confers is hyperconnectivity between brain areas. Now, in the case of colored hearing, the grapheme recognition area on the left fusiform gyrus sits adjacent to the color area called B4, which gets activated by the visual appearance of the letter. And despite having normal color vision, synesthetes say that they see strange or weird colors that they wouldn't pick deliberately. A colorblind synesthete speaks of seeing Martian colors. You see, his retinal pigments are abnormal, but V4 is intact, and that gets vision driven by non-optical inputs. So that again argues against childhood memories, because how could you remember colors that you've never seen or that you're incapable of seeing? So that's the most common type of synesthesia. More relevant to tonight's exhibit is the second most common type of synesthesia, colored hearing. And that's the activation of color, shape, and movement by sound, by everyday environmental sounds, by voices, and especially by music, hence the title of the exhibit, Visual Music. Imagine an experience like fireworks, colored shapes that arise, they move a little bit, and they fade away and they're replaced by another, and another, and another a kaleidoscopic montage, so long as the sound is persisting. Now, both Clay and Kandinsky trained as professional musicians, and they claimed that music made them see things. But before I get to them, let me deal with the skeptic's final criticism, which is that synesthetes are just being metaphoric, no different than saying loud tie or sharp cheese. But think a minute. Cheese isn't sharp, it's physically soft. And why use a touch adjective to describe a taste sensation? Or a taste term to describe a person, as in, she's really sweet. I mean, there's a circularity in saying that synesthesia is just metaphoric, because we don't understand how metaphor is represented in the brain. Rather, turn the argument on its head, and perhaps understanding the concrete physical sensation of synesthesia can help us get a neurologic handle on the, on, the, on the basis, a handle on the neurologic basis of metaphor and perhaps even creativity. Now, I know that's going to send some of the curators here into apoplexy. I mean, how dare science try to penetrate the mystery of art? But I don't think there's a danger there. Well, I said we had to distinguish between the idea of sensory fusion and the genuine perceptual phenomenon that occurs in the absence of any external cause, like LSD, or a brain abnormality, like epilepsy, which triggers synesthesia in about 4% of cases. And years ago, I proposed five features to do exactly that. First of all, you don't do anything. Synesthesia happens to you. So first, it's involuntary and automatic. And it's easy to show that by what's called perceptual grouping. If I show you a matrix of fives and then tell you that hidden within it is a shape outlined by twos, it'll take you a while to search and find it. But synesthetes, who see twos as differently colored than fives, very quickly say, oh, there's a red triangle, 